I'd like to talk about is uh, something crucially important, actually very modern stuff, uh, which is cryptography. Th this, uh, this keeps showing up over and over and over again. I feel like actually this is one of the key things operating systems sort of can and should provide. Uh, it's a lot of it's pretty new. Uh, when when you know uh, Linux, uh, Mac, uh, w Windows were sort of uh, 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 when they were picking what features were going to make it in the operating system, crypto was uh, a lot more primitive than it is now. And th there's only a couple of algorithms that kind of have survived from that era. So uh, this is a tricky talk to give because cryptography is some of the most sophisticated, you know, subtle, weird mathematics known to man. Uh, and this is uh, uh, way more than I can do in a, uh, you know, so I, I have basically one lecture left <laughs> uh, af after this one. So <clears throat> I'm not really going to talk about how to write these things. And uh, th there, there's a second reason to not talk about how to write them. You shouldn't write them. You should find an existing library that does them. And this is not just out of sheer laziness as it is normally, right? Uh, it, it's because writing cryptography correctly is really hard. And if you don't write it correctly, uh, th things can be subtly wrong in such a way that you're leaking information you thought was secret, and that's really super duper bad. So th things like timing attacks, uh, th th things like uh, side channel attacks, things like uh, uh, sort of leaking temporary uh, data, super duper common, but very easy to accidentally do. So uh, don't 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 do it. You, you use an existing implementation like an open SSL that's sort of tuned to avoid those things. Ah, uh, so the, the classes of algorithms you got in cryptography. There, there's, I claim there's only four that, uh, that I, I think you should care about. One is hashing, that turns a string into a hash, used for change detection. Uh, one is key exchange, used for basically setting up uh, a, a, a shared secret between two machines, even though somebody can intercept everything that's happening. Uh, uh, the, the sort of classic one is encryption. So this is just taking a shared secret and then munging data in some way to make uh, uh, encrypted data and use the same shared secret to decrypt it. Uh, to, uh, and, and this is used for full disk encryption, HTTPS, actual data transport is all encrypted. And then the, the last algorithm is a signature algorithm. And this usually takes a hash and makes a signature that's hard to forge. So the, the idea is that uh, basically anybody can check the signature but you need, the, you need a, a separate piece of data called the private key in order to make new signatures. So the, the, those, are, those are the four things, which hopefully that's pretty straightforward. So, let, so yeah, yeah. D does anybody know of other cryptography that uh, they want to know about before we dig into each of these one at a time? Stunned silence, excellent. So, uh, so hashing. So basically getting with a hash, you take a message, just a string of bytes, you run a hash algorithm on the bytes, which usually just takes chunks of the message and does some sort of processing. And you come with an, a, basically a, a hash is just a big number at the end. And the idea is if you change the message, the hash ought to change. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, if the hash is, if, if, I, if I input the same message, I get the same hash back out. So it should be deterministic but it should be really hard to predict. So in particular, uh, you, you use hashes in a lot of places. So if I do it, if I doubt, if I get a big file, it's a couple gigs, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of bytes in those gigs. Uh, and it'd be nice if I could just grab a copy of the file from some mirror site that's clo physically closer to me that had better network connection. But then the problem is I don't know if I'm getting the same bytes. So the idea is that uh, you publish the original file, and that's, that's the first place people can download it, and the hash, and then uh, I can download this file from some untrustworthy source, hash it, and if the hashes are the same, it's probably the same file. Yeah. Is this the same hash we learned about, like uh, hash tables? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, a, a cryptographic hash is, uh, it's, it's the same idea as in a hash table, right? So, so to, to, put a, to put a piece of data into a hash table, I have to come up with the, the slot in the hash table to use, so I use a hash algorithm. A cryptographic hash, hash algorithm usually outputs a much bigger hash because you really don't want hash collisions. Uh, you, you don't ever want two different things to have the same hash. So, so uh, it might be easiest to just show you how this works. So essentially, there's, there's some command line tools like uh, you can do a SHA-256, uh, is, so SHA is the secure hash algorithm. Uh, hopefully it is actually secure. Uh, so I, I can run this on a file. So I can see what my, and oh gosh, apparently I don't even have SHA-256. Uh, right. Apparently it's in a package called hash a lot. Uh, 
I don't know. Actually, I, I think I probably just called it this, this the wrong thing. So SHA-256 SUM? Oh, it's, it's called SHA-256 SUM. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know what I just got. So SHA-256, so let's see if SHA-256 is the same. Nope. Okay, so, and yeah, that's that's great. So, I, I don't know what SHA-256 does. So, let's see. So, uh, SHA-256 SUM, that's the one that I should have used uh, to start with. So, if, if I hash, a f so LS, right? It's a, it's a program, but it, it's uh, it's treating it as a big file, big binary file. And uh, if you hash all the bytes in bin ls, you get this crazy thing is the hash uh, uh, the hash value. So the cool part is, if somebody changes bin ls, then this hash is uh, is almost certainly going to change. So l l let me just uh, show you how much this changes. So for example, I can hash foo, and uh, pipe that to sha two fifty six sum. And uh, th that's the hash of the word foo. So this is the three letters foo, but it has a new line. If I if I have a foo question mark, y you notice there is no simple relationship between the right. I just added a question mark, and the numbers are just totally different. Essentially, in fact, it, generally speaking, uh, half the half the bits are the same, and half the bits are different, which means it's basically binary unpredictable. Yes. Well, but you only change. Uh, Mm. Like a mm, yep, 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 yep. So this is, uh, uh, let's see. How about we do what, uh, yeah. It, uh, it, it has the same property no matter how big it is. So like this, it's really huge, man. I mean, super. Yes, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, so if you, if you, so if, if instead of huge, it's capital G. That's actually only one bit different. Then uh, it's totally different. I mean, it's uh, it, it's literally like 100% uh, uh, unrelated, which is which is cool, right? And and a, a properly functioning hash basically changes, uh, you know, I should say all the bits. Uh, basically, right? There's there's no relationship between the two hashes of strings that are different, uh, and it's it's so if uh, if somebody just gives you this string, it's actually really hard to figure out what uh, what the original message was. Right, so so, the, the, so, so uh, two, two things you want out of hash. One is collision resistance. I don't want two strings that hash to the same thing. And uh, the other is you want pre-image resistance. So I can, uh, 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 hash can uh, be sitting somewhere. It's hard to figure out what the message is. Uh, it, it, it turns out it's always possible to take a hash and figure out what the message is. How would you, what's the algorithm for uh, starting from a hash and going backwards? This works for any hash. Uh, so uh, let's see. So if I know if I if I know I have the hash of a letter, then I can just try all those single letter values and see what I got here. Uh, and actually, I should. Uh, so if I want one letter, I don't need a new line. So knows that the hash of a is just always going to be that. So if uh, if somebody can go through and sort of repeat the input to the hash, hash is deterministic. So the, the, but but uh, uh, if a hash is working right. The best known algorithm for figuring out what the message was is to try all the messages, uh, which uh, which gets really expensive. So so in particular, if you're trying to protect a password, common trick is you just hash it. Uh, n n nice part being that then you get this big chunk of binary data, even if the password was literally like A is a lame password, right? It's it's tiny. Uh, everybody can see that it's tiny. If you hash it, you just get this random gibberish. And uh, that's the, 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 so. So uh, the random gibberish actually has a lot, lots of properties that are better. It's always the same size. SHA-256 gives you a 256-bit hash, so you get fixed size uh, data, which actually is easier to allocate and faster to process. And yeah. Would there be a problem if, like, your machine put a hash into the password and then the password hashed the hash? You, you can't. Ha so you can totally hash the hashes. This gets kind of meta. So I can. So take the SHA-256 checksum, that I get this thing, and I treat that as a string that I hash again. Right, exactly. And that's yeah. Like well, it's, 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 it's fairly common. Like, if I hash the passwords and you hash the passwords, but then you hash the hash, we, we're, it's not going to be the same. Right. Yeah, yeah, so as, as long as we do the same number of hashes, we actually should end up in the same place because it's all deterministic. We do have to, you have to agree on the formats for everything to get it to, or iterated hashing to work, but yes. So yeah. for an attacker to use a captured hash to figure out your password, they would also need to know the hashing algorithm that was 
the, 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 well, uh, unfortunately, like if it's 256 bits long, it's probably SHA-256. If it's 160 bits long, it's probably the ripe 160, right? It's like the, there's there's known uh, links. But like yeah. you're just saying, if you mm. hashed it multiple times, mm. you might not know how many times you hashed it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the other, so the nice part about hashing it multiple times, there's actually several password protection algorithms that hash the password like 4,000 times, which is, it, and it's, it, it, but it's just a constant, like all, you always hash it 4,000 times, and it's just to make it more expensive for an attacker to check, mm -hmm. right? And it's pretty cheap for you to just take the user's password, you hash it 4,000 times, like that's not really that big a deal, the pro, because you only have one password to hash. If they're trying to just brute force every possible password, then it makes it a lot more expensive for them. Yeah? So. If you're trying to brute force an encrypted thing backwards, how yeah. do you tell if you got it? Well, it's so, so if, if, if like, uh, I, I'm, I'm making up random strings and hashing them, and the point where, like, I make up random string and it hashes to exactly what you were looking for, that's it, and you're done. And uh, actually, there are, there are really scarily good tools for brute forcing passwords. Actually, so, so uh, uh, Hashcat is is a tool that runs. It uses GPUs. Like uh, if you have like a, a rack of eight, uh, you know, GTX 1080s in your machine, like it will distribute the cracking over all of those GPUs. Like uh, and and you can you can crack some uh, really surprisingly long and complicated passwords in surprisingly short period of time. The, the other thing that's kind of scary about Hashcat, you give it a list of things you might think be the password, and it'll start with those, and then start combining them or adding on things. And the, I mean, it's it's ra it's randomly guessed stuff that you would not think would be even possible to guess. Are you the search basis. Try to like It'll do the usual things, yeah. We're like, oh, I replace the I in the word with a capital with a number one, right? Or I replace like l lowercase with uppercase in random orientations. Or I put an exclamation mark in the end because all the stupid password algorithms require like a, 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 you know some sort of uh, thing. So you're just like, oh, I'll just add the punctuation at the end. So you just ch -ch -ch, you know it's e easy to, to uh, predict how those things are going to uh, work. That's all baked into Hashcat, so this this is still a little bit scary. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so. Generally speaking, it's it's considered good practice. Uh, if I've got like a database table of usernames, I should have the hash of the password, not the bare password. It's not perfect. Like if somebody steals the hash of the password, then eventually, if they do enough work, they could probably uh, recover them. But it's better than just having the bare password like stored in the database table. Uh, the, the the cool part is like uh, once I hash it, I don't even know what their password was. I don't care. <laughs> Like they, they try and log in on the client. I, I r run a hash before I even do anything with it, right? I don't send it, I don't uh, process it unless it's already hashed. There's a, there's a, yeah. there's a site I yeah. follow where yeah. people keep track of websites that just keep track of their passwords. Yeah, like yeah. You go, you go and say, I forgot my password. They're like, oh, we're <laughs> sending your password back to you. And you're like, no, nah, I don't want that. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so send it in an email. That's, uh, e e e email is, Email evolved from like non encrypted protocols. So, yeah. Yeah. Is there an attack where like you log in by like just injecting the hash that you want? So. Well, so, so they call this pass the hash, uh, and uh, basically, if if you're just using not passwords but original ha but hashes for everything, you may not even need the password. You just like you know you need a special client to do this, but you basically just send in the hash that you stole from somewhere, and then uh, uh, that's that's good as an authentication token. Uh, l lots of counter counter. Uh, this is this is the way security works, right? Like you have like. Got passwords to protect the machines. People steal the passwords, so they attack the machines. I hash the passwords to make them harder to steal. Oh, people just steal the hashes instead of the passwords. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the hash from their original password, and then I'm going to hash the hash with a random number that I send from the server, so you can't use the same hash to authenticate more than once. And then we do we do, we do the same trick on both sides, and then we get the uh, yeah so. Still not perfect because then if they could intercept this original one, then the the un the un uh, so, but you can yeah so, so, so iterated hashing and uh, of course there's countermeasures to this and uh, back and forth forever that's uh, war never changes. Uh, so yeah so, so okay, question about how hashes work? There's a bunch of hash algorithms. There's uh, there's one that's really famous and ancient called MD5. So MD5 sum you can see how old it is because it's really a short hash. Uh, 
And uh, it's it's really popular. It's actually baked into several languages, like PHP has a keyword for you know, uh, MD5 some. Uh, MD5 is what they call, uh, uh, so, so SHA-256. No one has found two strings that have the same SHA-256 hash. And it's only 256 bits worth, right? So if you got like 300 bits of data, like one line of text, there's got to be tons of different one single lines of text that have the same SHA-256 hash. It's just, there's so many of them, right? There's 256 bits worth, right? So two, you, you do like two to the 256 check uh, checking and eventually you'll find one. It's just, that's a large number. Uh, MD5 uh, is, it's A, it's shorter, which makes it easier to find collisions, and B, uh, the structure of the hash has been broken such that uh, uh, people can basically construct multiple strings that have the same MD5 shum. Right, and this is kind of a known thing. Uh, th this is this is really bad depending on what you're trying to do. It's it's actually it's a little weird. It's still fine to use MD5 to protect a password, other than the fact that MD5 is pretty high performance hash. So Hashcat is Hashcat really works great on uh, uh, MD5. Uh, so so uh, t uh, other than being efficient, there's nothing particularly wrong with it as, as far as uh, protecting passwords, but uh, uh, people tend to do other stuff. So we're going to see several uses of hashing uh, for, for more sophisticated crypto operations. MD5 is definitely not useful for those. Uh, so, so for example, you might sign a hash uh, with a uh, public key, and that's, that's a really bad idea with MD5, because someone could get you to sign one copy that says like, oh yeah, Lawler runs Lawler.cs. And then you could have secretly come up with a separate like uh, 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 signature that says Lala runs whitehouse.gov. Then I'm president. Yes. Uh, at, at the point where people started buying things on the internet, how advanced was cryptography? Was it, it was. It was getting there. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, so, so uh, hash algorithms. Uh, MD5 is from the 70s. SHA-256, I think, is from the 90s. I, sh I should have looked up the, the dates. I mean, the, 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 the stuff was pretty well known. And, and the notion like, uh, so don't store passwords in clear text, store their hash. Dates from like the 1970s, Unix started doing that, right? Like the, the shadow, uh, Etsy shadow instead of Etsy password. Uh, so to totally, totally well known. You know, the, the annoying part is like uh, uh, the, your your normal processing path can be like take the user's password, hash it, do some awesome like you know random number token authentication key that goes to the server. So you've got it really well set up. But then there'll be some like sign up process, some debug process, some log file. I, I believe with Facebook the problem was like some log was actually like just logging requests and it got everything, including like the passwords so in there. there. Yeah. 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 I, I need a password manager. Uh, uh, see, so, so SHA-256, SHA-256, that's what you should use nowadays because it's basically like, uh, it's supported pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's, it's actually the hash that Bitcoin, a bunch of stuff in Bitcoin is based on. I'm hoping to do uh, Bitcoin, or uh, cryptocurrency stuff uh, on Friday. Uh, so uh, SHA-1, SHA uh, SHA-1 was actually, it's sort of the predecessor to SHA-2D6, uh, uh, basically the same structure, but Google actually uh, managed to find a collision with a lot of work. Uh, so it's, it's actually broken for signatures, but it's still fine for passwords and things. Like. Sure. Okay. Questions about hashes? All right, uh, question. Right. Yeah. Uh, so why is it bad for signatures and not passwords? Uh, do the same thing with passwords? Uh, so, so the, the, what would make it bad for passwords is someone can come up with some enormous, like, you know, 80 character long binary gibberish that works as their password, and a slightly different 80 cares of binary gibberish also works as their password. Like, okay, cool. But like the, 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 there's no so, so uh, MD5 is still not broken as far as pre-image resistance, which is really what you need. That's all you basically all you need for uh, 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 password protection. Oh, so you couldn't like find the actual password. Yeah. So if, if you give me an MD uh, an MD5 hash, the cheapest way to figure out what the message is is just try all the messages. And and that's that's true for every hash, right? That's true for for good working hashes as well. It's it's a little faster for MD5 just because uh, it's a short hash. But uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, next step, uh, and this is crucial for doing network stuff. 
So uh, uh, key exchange is the process of doing some local compute and some untrusted network comms and coming up with something that is, uh, uh, that is, that is uh, uh, shared between you that someone watching every network message you send can't get, it, which is weird. It, it's, 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 it's weird this is even possible, in fact, <laughs> right? In, in other words, like, I can, I can t you know, be, be talking to any one of you, and we can sort of be, you know, we'll have some, some data we can keep secret, and uh, uh, somebody can, like, uh, you know, hear everything we say, but still not be able to figure out what we have actually communicated, which is uh, kind of beautiful. Is, hey, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is this kind of like the mailbox principle, where you got something in the mailbox, so that we I haven't heard the mailbox principle. Yeah. Uh, not principle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for something like HTTPS, right? You you, you want to connect to some server. You want nobody to be able to intercept uh, your your connection to the server. But everything you're sending, like on Wi-Fi, it's all just getting blasted out in the ether, right? Like if the aliens in space could be just you know sucking down all of the uh, the data. Uh, which uh, so, so uh, the, 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 the theoretical idea here is that I'm gonna I'm gonna basically just make a random local number and I can make that up you know myself and then you make up your own uh, random local number and then we're gonna do an irreversible operation a hash a hash is designed to be sort of irreversible right pure image resistance it turns out a hash doesn't uh, nobody's figured out how to do a hash this way because it doesn't have the the next step you need which is a commutative operation so a commutative operation meaning like a times b is the same as b times a so you need something with some algebraic structure to it, but you also need something with, uh, uh, and this is a little bit weird, like normal algebra doesn't really have irreversible operations. Like if I add, you can subtract, right? If I multiply, you can divide. If I exponentiate, you can take the log, right? Like uh, pretty much all of our normal operations have inverses. Uh, so, so you try and find a space where you basically can compute forward operations, but inverse operations are hard. And, and th th there's quite a few of these known in mathematics. So, so uh, finite fields is uh, this is this is like everybody's favorite way to do crypto. And, and this is true for all of the remaining crypto we're going to be looking at. So, so finite field is is like modular arithmetic, for example, right? So I, I do arithmetic, and then uh, once it gets the number gets too big, I just uh, so I, I I basically just compute the right answer, and then I wrap it around modulo some big number. And it turns out, if you take arithmetic modulo a big prime number, you can actually get like addition and subtraction still work the normal way. It turns out multiplication and even division works, even though everything's integers. You actually have uh, uh, multiplicative inverses, which is a little bit weird. Like uh, so, to multiply by two, things get bigger, but then the big things wrap around. So if you actually multiply by, I think it's the middle element essentially, like you, you scale everything so it actually maps back to where it began. So it turns out you have, you have multiplication and division in a, uh, a uh, like a prime field, which is kind of cool. And the irreversible operation of prime field is uh, t uh, is exponentiation. So essentially, I'm just going to raise a, n a number to a power, and this is all in working in a big prime field, and that turns out to be irreversible. The commutative operation you do is actually just multiplication, right? Because multiplication is commutative; doesn't matter the order that I do the multiplication in. So essentially, I can do my exponentiation. So I'll, I'll do an exponential. You will do an exponential. We send the exponentials, and then the, the trick is that in a prime field, it's hard to reverse an exponential. They call this the discrete logarithm problem. So th this is where. Yeah, if I had a week or a month to talk about this. I, I actually, at one point, there was a whole class called cryptography. <laughs> be nice if we had time to teach those. Uh, so, yeah, so, so uh, uh, th th there's some mathematics. So, so in particular, the, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is basically you're, you're doing all your arithmetic in this big prime field. Uh, you, can, you can actually just literally make up a, a new uh, prime number to do your arithmetic in, or it turns out you can actually all be working in a sort of known fixed prime field for this particular one. Uh, the, the, the field is so huge, it doesn't even, it doesn't even help to, everybody can use the same prime field, a little weird. Uh, so you, you're just gonna pick a number that has good uh, exponent properties. Uh, we're gonna make up uh, two random numbers, A and B. So essentially I've made up this random number A, you've made up your random number B. We raise our generator number to a generator is usually like two or something, right? It's usually simple. Uh, so I, I, I just take two to my random, my uh, secret number. You raise two to your secret number, uh, all modulo this big prime. And of course, the, the numbers, it, 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 it seems like they would intermediate get huge. Turns out in, in a prime field, like if I've got a 1024-bit prime, 
all my numbers are basically 1024 bits, which is nice, right? So this is uh, it's a reasonable amount of data. Uh, and then I can basically just, I can send you G to the, so I just computed G to the A. Uh, so I send you G to the A, and then you raise it to the B. Uh, you sent me your G to the B, and I raise it to the A power. And, and basically, I don't know if this is legible at all. So, so what, what, what makes this work is the fact that multiplication, so, so a exponentiation, uh, so, so repeated exponentiation is like multiplying the exponents. And then uh, t uh, t uh, it turns out e e e uh, multiplication is commutative. So, so the irreversible operation is exponentiation, which is it's hard to reverse in a prime, uh, big prime field. And, uh, and then the commutative operation is a multiplication. So, so the, the weird part is we've, an attacker can see g to the a and g to the b, and they can't, they don't have the original numbers, so they can't figure out what our shared secret is, which is a little weird. So we actually just made this shared key, and no one else in the world can know that except us, because we have our secrets. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's just uh, to algebra, but it's the abstract uh, algebra uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's actually it's it's four hundred so six hundred level mathematics. mathematics. Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, it's elementary algebra. In other words, from the elements. Of, uh, of algebra. So uh, uh, basic idea, and, and, and th this is true for a lot of crypto algorithms, essentially like there's some prime numbers involved, there's some wacky mathematics. If you screw up the mathematics, A, your code might not work. B, you may come up with a shared secret that's always zero, right? Like might, uh, might not be a good idea to do that. Uh, so, uh, right. so questions about this thing? So, so, so this is called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's ancient from the 70s, right? And uh, it's, it is actually the basis of uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of HTTPS. Like this is, I connect across the network. This is the first thing I do is I establish a shared secret. Uh, it's, it's, so so uh, you can intercept these all you want because they're sort of already been exponentiated. It's hard to figure out what A and B are other than just brute forcing every possible uh, uh, value, which in a 1024-bit space is even worse than the 256-bit hash, right? Uh, super hard to figure out. Uh, the uh, uh, 1024 bits is barely enough. Uh, it uh, turns out uh, they've actually cracked 768 bits. So 2048 is probably a better idea. Uh, uh, if, if you're using prime fields, 2048 bits is starting to get, it's like uh, uh, 512 bytes. What's, what's 2048 over, uh, uh, 2v6 bytes, I believe. Uh, so so th th that's a lot. That's a couple of lines of text, right, uh, as, as binary data. So uh, uh, there's also these things called elliptic curves. Elliptic curves, actually, just division is the expensive operation. So you can just do literally multiplication in, in an elliptic curve, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's its own strange definition of multiplication. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and elliptic curve crypto is beautiful, and... Uh, and uh, uh, so, so you'll either see just Diffie-Hellman key exchange, big primes, or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which is exactly the same idea. It's just we're in a different uh, uh, different number space uh, to do it. People are looking at Ted unsatisfied. Y yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Is this, the, the, this is literally like algebra algebra, right? Like. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and uh, so, so one of the, the weird parts about the, the abstract algebras is that uh, you set it up so that uh, basically certain number of the rules from you know, ordinary uh, algebra uh, continue working. So it, it turns out like the, the way you structure, a, so a prime field, for example, still has multiplication. You iterate multiplication to get exponentiation. Uh, it, tur it turns out uh, prime fields just don't have logs. That's the one thing, that, like logarithm doesn't really work in a prime field. And, and it's essentially because uh, you know, you, you've got this curve when you do an exponentiation, and the prime field means that it's going to wrap around. So you get uh, so if, if I if I have this output value, it's a really non-smooth function. So the, there's no real way to figure out like where I came from, uh, other than just trying all of the the x values. Surprising. Uh, so so uh, uh, yeah, if, uh, if if you constructed the prime field correctly and your arithmetic is all correct, then essentially you still get the rules of normal arithmetic. And uh, yeah, uh, here, here's where to really explain how this works. I should do a little bit of code. 
the scary part is then you're going to want to implement it yourself. I, 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 Diffie Hellman maybe is okay to implement yourself. Yeah. Is there a course offered here that's just like not so much the theory behind cryptography and security, but just like here are the rules that you should follow mm. to not screw up at your job? Mm. <laughs> Hopefully that's this lecture. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, so, so Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, it's, uh, th it's this well-known thing, it's actually fairly ancient, and uh, it establishes a shared secret with nothing except like, uh, you know, observable network operations and sort of locally generated stuff. Yes? Is this what SSH does? A SSH does a key exchange in the same way. A actually, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and this, this raises a great point. Uh, so, uh, couple of things that you really get so it's easy to screw this up in a few ways so uh, there have been cases where the local secret was guessable uh, people will say like oh I'll just call Rand that looks random Rand gives you the same random numbers every time you call it so pretty much if the program starts up and it always its local secret is always going to be predictable like you have literally no secrecy whatsoever right it's total fail so people are like oh uh, we'll s Rand time that means any shared secrets you generate in one second are going to be identical, which is really bad. Uh, but uh, time is not a secret, <laughs> right? And in particular, if, if you SRAN with time and then like generate the, uh, the, the local secret, this, uh, this is like uh, uh, way too easy to guess. I mean, the problem is you need like a 20, 20, 48 bits of really unguessably random stuff. And this is, this is hard, to, hard to do. So, so uh, th th there's uh, dev u random. Is designed so this is built into the kernel and it just uh, uh, cat uh, be random. Its job is to spit out random gibberish that is unpredictable. Just <laughs> a little weird. Okay, so, so, so that's uh, that, that's binary gibberish. Let me uh, base sixty four it. I guess that's yeah, that's ASCII gibberish. It's just non repeating gibberish. That's its whole job. It just emits gibberish. It's usually made by ha so. Uh, uh, yeah, in, 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 inside there, the kernel, uh, it stores the insta, so the sort of nanosecond timestamp of a keystroke uh, network uh, packet arriving, like unpredictable stuff. Uh, it, it, uh, it basically, any, any randomness that it can extract from the hardware, it actually goes into the kernel randomness pool, and then when you want to uh, pull stuff out, you hash it, which makes it hard for somebody to reconstruct the pool. Yes? Are there some, are there some websites still that just use Uh, did, so, uh, ha hashes of passwords sounds plausible. Ha has, has those properties? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so, so, so usually none of these. So, so this is like not really user facing at all. So, so Divi element is something you do at uh, connection startup, and basically like it's it's just authenticating one machine against another, or it's 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 setting up a shared secret with some other machine. Now, here's the problem with uh, Diffie Hellman: y you get perfect secrecy with the other side, but you have no idea who the other side is, right? So, so for example, uh, uh, if someone owns my network, they cannot just read the data like I'm sending on. So, like, I want to make a connection to Lawler.cs. I'm like, cool, let me send a packet off to Lawler.cs. And I get a packet back saying, like, oh, yeah, here's my part of the shared secret. How do I know it's really from Lawler.cs? I don't. <laughs> so uh, th so th th there's an attack against Divi Hellman called Man in the Middle where essentially like you can do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with the attacker, right? And then the attacker can actually do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with the server. And then you can pull anything you want with the, from the server, but uh, unfortunately the man in the middle gets to read it all, which is super annoying. Uh, Diffie-Hellman doesn't have anything to prevent that, which is annoying. So, so th 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 that's where we need more stuff. Uh, in particular, you, you, need, you need some signatures after Diffie-Hellman. Diffie-Hellman just so, so Diffie-Hellman means no one that can read the stuff on the wire is going to be able to intercept. Uh, st st so, so I can encrypt stuff based on the shared secret from this point on, and then uh, t uh, and then I'm then I'm good. Questions about key exchange? All right. Uh, the classic encryption algorithm is encryption. <laughs> it's just 
basically, I have some secret. I use the secret to turn some plain text into ciphertext. I use the same secret to turn the ciphertext back into plain text. So this is this is like ancient. This is the the sort of fundamental cryptographic operation. Uh, the uh, uh, so, so for example, the Caesar cipher right takes plain text, adds thirteen. The the key is constant. That's the ciphertext. You subtract thirteen. That's the back to the plain text. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I was thinking about. Ah. Yeah. There's a lot of key, keys that occur all over the place. Uh, so, so uh, symmetric ciphers are, uh, uh, there's, there's a, so examples like the uh, AES or ChaCha or uh, RC5, RC4, DES, like the, these are all symmetric ciphers. Uh, it's, it's kind of the, so if, if I have data on the network that I want to encrypt, we do a Diffie-Elman key exchange to have a shared secret. Then like everything that goes across the network just has to be encrypted with that secret and we're pretty good other than the fact that I don't quite totally know who I'm talking to. It's definitely getting the other side okay, whoever that other side is. Yeah? So, with this one, is the key constant or can the key change? Can it be like shift one the first letter and then two the second letter and so on? So uh, as long as you know how much you're shifting every time, you just reverse it? Or is that a different element? Well, so, so it, 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 in, encryption can take that key and do whatever it wants with it to the plain text. And usually it's got to be way more complicated than a per letter operation. Like that's, that's it. So, so actually all of the ciphers that you can like just do on paper yourself are just totally broken at this point. Like it, it has to be some fairly heavy duty, like, uh, you know, if it doesn't use a couple hundred bits of secret key, it's pretty much gone. Right? You can enumerate all the keys. You can uh, to, I mean, to, to too, too many known attacks uh, against the thing. So would like a, a two questions then. Yeah. Would RC5 fall under this category? Yes, yes. Yeah. And number two, how come the uh, Zodiac cipher was hailed as so magic, you know, I don't so know. mysterious back in the 70s? Oh. And it was literally just a... What, what is the Zodiac cipher? Oh, like the Zodiac, Zodiac killer, you said. Oh. Yeah. Posted, you know, uh, oh. uh, a letter in the newspaper and said, you know, if you don't publish this, I'm going to kill people. Hmm. And a bunch of cryptologists were like, you can't break it; it's too scary. Hmm. And it turned out it was just uh, like substitution. A was, you know, a triangle. B was a circle. Hmm. Something like that. Hmm. Guys. Hmm. I guess this is. Uh, it's like. Letter substitution is, I mean, so, so that, that I, yeah, I sh should say, uh, traditionally, the, the, when you do cryptanalysis, the, the standard assumption is that uh, you have an arbitrary amount of plain text that you know, you have an arbitrary amount of cipher text that you've intercepted, and uh, basically, like, so, so if, if you have a couple of gigabytes of these things, which you get in, like, an hour on a real network, right? Then uh, uh, essentially, like the, the encryption algorithm, the secret key should still, like the secret key should still be resistant, even if you have arbitrary amounts of uh, source data. Because uh, you get like like frequency analysis is, uh, uh, starts to break down if I've got a really short message, especially if it's written by a crazy person. And I really don't know what they were. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. I mean, if, if, you, if you just switch the font to symbol or something, that's, uh, that's pretty good against most people, but it's really not. Frequency analysis, actually, the cryptanalysis is another whole talk, so I shouldn't get into that. Yes? So, like, I encrypt a disk, and then I just yeah. password. So, so the usual way full disk encryption works is when the machine boots, it says like, okay, you want to decrypt your volume, you enter the password, you enter the password, it will usually hash the password, and then it uses that as the source of the secret key to decrypt disk blocks. Yeah. So all of these that kind of use each other? It, uh, it, it's definitely, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, the secret key ideally is like, you know, a couple, like 256 bits of random uh, uh, binary data. And if it's not random binary data, like it's got a bunch of leading zeros because your password is not uh, 286 bits long, then uh, that's that's super bad. That means that uh, you know the uh, you're not getting uh, your money's worth out of your uh, your symmetric encryption, and uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. So, so so hash is pretty common to use uh, uh, to prepare the secret key. Uh, and the, you know the other thing is like if I'm decrypting a disk, 
you probably don't want to have to decrypt the whole disk from the beginning in order to read any part of it. You want to be able to just jump to some random spot and then say, I'm reading disk block 4,973,263, and uh, that will just work. So it uh, so traditionally it takes like the password, maybe hashes it a few million times, uh, and uh, uh, sticks on the block you're after, hashes that. That's the secret key used to decrypt that block. So, so then basically every block gets its own uh, uh, separate uh, secret key. I mean, th th there, there are, th there's a million ways you can, you can mess this up, certainly. Like, uh, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm encrypting stuff on a block-by-block -block basis, then essentially an attacker might not have any idea what's in the block, but they know that this block is the same as that block. If they were encrypted the same way, they're going to have the same ciphertext, right? If, if it's the same plain text and the same secret key, it's going to be the same ciphertext. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. It's basically useless because, like, they, they basically showed an attack where they were able to break full disk encryption by just, like, doing something to the unencrypted sector. Hmm. Um, uh, I guess so. Yeah, it doesn't make it useless. Actually, there's a t known attacks against all of these things. I mean, the, the machine boots, and it boots into like a kernel. It, I mean, it's running x86 machine code that's not encrypted, and and th th that x86 machine code has to like ask the user for a password, and then use that password to like you know to decrypt the rest of the disk. Now the problem is somebody could go in and say, yeah, I'm going to ask the user for the password, send it off to Bulgaria, and then use it to decrypt their disk and send it all to Bulgaria, right? Like, oh, shoot. Right, uh, doesn't doesn't actually help you. So, uh, but it does keep your it, it keeps you. So, if somebody steals your laptop, then it still helps you because you uh, they don't have the secret key. There's no way for them to figure out what the encrypted ciphertext on your hard drive actually represents. So, so that I mean, still still not totally useless. <laughs> yeah, and, and it uh, I don't know. C c crypto has uh, there's sort of a bad habit of saying like you know, algorithm X like MD5 hashing is broken. And what they mean is the sort of mathematical perfection that we expect from all of our cryptographic operations no longer holds, right? Collision resistance is not there for MD5. But it doesn't mean that you've lost everything about MD5, right? Like pre-image resistance still seems to be there, so that's, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, for example, okay, questions? How would you ever have like, true collision resistance on a cryptographic algorithm? It's impossible. It it yeah, yeah. Small. If the output is a fixed size, it's impossible to have perfect collision resistance. Unless you yeah. restrict the <laughs> if the input is less than two to six, then you could have perfect. Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, AES uh, AES uses some really awful Galois field uh, arithmetic, it, and it's it's basically an it's, it's arithmetic operations is how it does the uh, uh, the encryption stuff. I actually kind of like uh, cha cha is in the the sort of RC five family, and it's basically just a bunch of bitwise rotates with uh, with some uh, adds to do carries to mix bits together. <laughs> it's called cha cha. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, so, so uh, it, it, it's from the salsa family of ciphers, apparently. And it's, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, right. It, it, uh, uh, I mean, the, the culprit, so I can show you Chacha's internal structure. So essentially, the, uh, it, it's, uh, it's cyclic bit shifts, XORs, and uh, adds. So, so the, 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 there's adds that have carries, and then there's XORs, which are basically adds without carries. And and, uh, and and then it's basically just taking pieces of this. So, so this is one round. It takes like four, it, it breaks the input into four int size chunks, does these operations to mix the chunks together, and then just repeats this 20 times. Uh, m many of these things end up being sort of blender-like, that they're, they're just used to mix in inputs together. And uh, of course, each of these operations is separately reversible, but unless you know basically all of the input data, including the secret key, it's hard to reverse the whole computation. Uh, I, I don't know. So, so there's so DES, the data encryption standard. It, uh, it it sort of died out in the 90s when because the key is only 56 bits long, which means you can brute force the key. I mean, today in just a few days on a, a GPU implementation. So this so it was just it died because its key was too short. Uh, arguably, in, the key was intentionally too short to make it uh, uh, just GES barely crackable. What, uh, GSM uses because I think that's what I don't recall. It's, it seems plausible. Actually, the uh, uh, for a long time. So this is 
So the, the National Security Agency is the U.S. Uh, 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 agency charged with two things. One is protecting the U.S. government and the U.S. Uh, sort of national secrets. And the other is to uh, breaking the secrets of other uh, everybody else in the world. And th that th there's, there's a real tension between those two things, right? So, for example, if the NSA announces, like, oh, we really like DES, you should totally use that, you're like, is that the good NSA or is that the bad NSA telling me that, right? <laughs> uh, it's hard to, hard, hard to say. So in, in this case, uh, DES turned out to say, so the, both of those wings were at work in DES because it turns out DES is resistant against differential cryptanalysis because they changed the substitution boxes to make it resistant to differential cryptanalysis, uh, which, so that was the good NSA. Like, uh, they actually uh, strengthened DES to make it resistant against analytic techniques that weren't known for, like, you know, several decades in the uh, uh, outside the NSA, uh, but the sort of bad NSA made the key only 56 bits long, which is really not long enough to uh, protect even against brute force. Uh, so, so eventually this thing died out. Uh, uh, U.S. government recommends AES, which uses either 128 or 256. 256 is more common just because it matches the size of SHA-256. Uh, and uh, 128 is it's not really that easy to crack, but it's like it, within the realm of theoretical possibility. Someday somebody maybe could brute force something. If you know, you convert the solar system into a computer, they're running really fast. You run it for a few million years, like uh, you know, you can you can get surprisingly far. Uh, the, the, the thing that scares people about AES is it uses all this fancy like uh, finite field arithmetic that like. There may be some algebraic attack against AES, which would be like bad NSA. Don't do that. Uh, it's possible that uh, that there isn't, and that was the good NSA. You can't tell which NSA you're talking to. So uh, I d d don't know. Uh, so so uh, NSA uh, NIST recommends AES for the U.S. government to encrypt classified data. So they must think that it's pretty hard to crack. So uh, yes. So when I apply for a government jobs, so yeah. there's always a message at the top of the screen that says, do not go to this website if you're not, like, within the United States, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, for so in the '90s, there was this whole battle about like what what crypto can we export, and uh, uh, 56 bits was export great. Like uh, if it's 56 bits or less, that's cool. You can give it away. You can sell it off to anybody you want. Uh, if it was more than that, then they didn't they didn't want it to be exported. Th th at some point, they removed. So uh, crypto was classified as a munition, which <laughs> seems a little a little weird. Especially, so I think what really made that untenable was somebody printed up T-shirts that have like you know the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is you know like it's not that much mathematics. Uh, and uh, theoretically, that T-shirt is now a munition. Like if you wear the T-shirt and leave the country, you're it's like exporting you know guns to some you know this is uh, yeah it's, it seems seems a little a little a little weird. But at, at some point, the government actually backed down and said like it's not a munition, it's math. I don't, I, I, not anymore. So, so uh, this actually was really, so in the 90s, right, the web is starting to be a thing. People are like, well, I'm, I want to write a web browser that has encryption that doesn't suck. Can I do that? Like, you can totally do that. You just have to make sure no non-American ever gets their hands on it. Like, it's the web. But like, <laughs> I mean, there's no way to, like, just give it away to, like, local... Uh, 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 local people only. So it, uh, yeah. It, so, so I mean, nowadays, like browsers come with really heavy-duty, hardcore encryption, which I'm hoping to get to. Okay, I got, I got ten minutes left. So, uh, symmetric ciphers. Questions? I mean, the hard part about a symmetric cipher, you just you need to share the secret key. So the idea with a signature algorithm is essentially to break this into two halves one half that you keep secret and one half that you can just give away and essentially the encryption process will basically is, is like signing a, a typically a hash and then uh, the decryption process is you 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 hopefully will let uh, if i take your digital signature ver verify the public key i should get the actual hash of the message you signed so this is what's used by https this is how certificates, uh, uh, digital certificates actually work, right? Uh, this is how you actually, you, you verify that you really got uh, Lawler.cs, the server's identity is proven because uh, there's a signature. 
And uh, essentially, there's actually usually a cascaded series of signatures. So the server has a signature. Uh, the server says like, oh, this is totally my public key. How do I know that's the server's public key? Well, uh, you sign the server's public key. So, so you, you treat that as a server's public key as a message, and you sign it with some key that eventually your browser trusts. Right now, your browser has hard coded in it the public keys for a bunch of different, like uh, you know, uh, like uh, VeriSign. Uh, uh, what are the uh, Komodo? The uh, some of the you know the big certificate authorities, sort of the roots of this uh, chain of trust. Uh, unfortunately, there's probably too many of them, but uh, uh, that's that's the political reality we live in. And uh, essentially, the browser can just, from nothing other than its own hard-coded data, validate that, like, yes, this came from VeriSign. I trust this data, right? Uh, and then uh, what, what VeriSign, so if, if you look, for example, on Google Docs, uh, you, you click the lock icon and you say, hey, show me the certificate for this website. And that's totally unreadable. So it says, this is really Google.com. I claim it totally is because, uh, let's see, so if you look, uh, Global Sign signed Google's, uh, uh, Google's sort of intermediate certificate that signed the, signed the server certificate for, for, for these things. So essentially, built into my browser is the Global Sign, uh, the, the public key for the Global Sign root certificate. So why is Global Sign signing Google's authorization even if you're using Chrome? Yeah. Google, Google wanted to demonstrate that, like, uh, we're doing this too. We're just uh, we're not built into trusted in our own browsers, right? Like, uh, we we will you know we will participate in the same certificate authority stuff. I mean, the, the theory actually is that the, these global certificate authorities are supposed to be absolutely deadly serious about protecting their private key. Like the so in particular, the private key is used to authenticate every possible website on the internet, right? Because uh, browsers are going to have hard-coded in there the public key for these global certificate authorities. So the private key really needs to be kept secret. Not like, oh, I don't want people reading my email secret. Like, you know, this is going to be super duper bad. Like explosions at power plants, at, you know, explosions in nuclear reactors bad if, uh, if, if somebody can like push an update and then, oh yeah, certificate checks out, this sounds good. Like, so, so how do you keep something that secret? Use a method of encryption that computers cannot, and then like <laughs> mm, just keep monks it in, or something. Keep, yes, keep it in, like the human <laughs> sphere and safe somewhere. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it's like twenty forty eight bits of random arithmetic, and then doing the actual signature is usually like more arithmetic than human beings could possibly. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, so, so so yeah, so, so this idea. So, so the question is, should you keep your private key on a server that's sitting on the internet? Well, for the global signing authority, that is considered like a firing offense, right? Like if if, if it's connected anywhere. So so, uh, so so this is kind of weird, right? They actually have uh, so the root key for DNSSEC. Uh, they actually publish the the key signing ceremonies. So they literally fly a bunch of people in, and uh, this is like two and a half hours of web stream. It's like really exciting. It's like, so, so the, the, these are all the, the sort of uh, the duly elected representatives from all of these organizations that have contributed a little slice of the private signing key for, uh, for the DNS route. Uh, and then essentially like there's this two hour li live stream of like this carefully scripted and you know, uh, orchestrated like, uh, See if I can find where it actually, so people actually start doing some things. So essentially like, so here's the safe, right? So there's a vault and they open the vault, right? This is in fact the only situation under which the vault gets opened. And the pieces of the signing key, which are in these tamper resistant envelopes get basically taken out. And then there's some official like, uh, you, know, you know, carefully observed protocol by which the, you know, the pieces of the key are used to incrementally sign the stuff. And they've tried to design this protocol such that uh, there can be a 5% chance that any one of these people is uh, is, is like evil, <laughs> and uh, there's still all, like a you know one in a billion chance that uh, that the system fails because of this that it's uh, that, that the, you know it's it's not detected. So so essentially like so tamper resistant envelope that has like a hardware designed cryptographically secure data storage uh, 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 scheme on there like designed to be like to, to, like read uh, read logging uh, uh, basically uh, reverse engineering resistant so uh, you can be really really serious about this and that's sort of what they expect out of uh, root, root CAs so for example uh, uh, CEO emails the private keys like this is like okay you're all banned forever <laughs> uh, which is, uh, is is super duper bad Got out of the bag, would you ever be able to make a private key that 
Yeah, so, so, so the, the trick is actually you're supposed to sort of roll your private keys like every couple of years you generate a new private key and then, you know, so, so uh, uh, I should say the other thing that's interesting about these certificates, if, if you look at a certificate, it's got a period that it's valid. So Google's certificates for their own servers are only good basically from March to June, right? That uh, They're like, we got like a three-month window. And uh, we think we can keep our servers, you know, the, the private key for our servers secret uh, until then. But like, uh, so, so they, they basically regen them on a, uh, you know, a couple of month, uh, uh, every couple of month interval, which is which is a good idea. So no, if it leaks out, there's only a certain window in which their their public key is uh, is bad. There's also like uh, key revocation lists and things to like say these keys are burned. Like no one should ever trust any of those things. It's, it's hard to guarantee you've gotten the message out to everywhere that it might need to get. Uh, if, if that happens. So, uh, uh, but, but pub public key signing algorithms, these are, uh, uh, it, it turns out to be, it's really a lot of the same tech as like a Diffie-Hellman. Uh, so, so like a RSA is basically just working in a big prime field. Modular exponentiation, uh, modular exponentiation uh, is, is basically what, uh, what keeps uh, RSA stuff, uh, stuff secret. Uh, ECDSA is, is the elliptic curve variant of that. Yeah. So if your browser says Yeah. What are the odds that you're not actually on that website? It, it's happened, but it's sort of a, like, you know, once a decade, some way to get the, 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 the keys out. Now, now th there, there are problems. The lock says, yes, docs.google.com is really where you're at because Google has a start at google.com key that matches this, uh, this server. Now, the, the, uh, the, the problem is uh, any of the CAs falls and like all bets are off, like anything, anybody can masquerade as anything, which is super duper bad. Uh, the, uh, t uh, if uh, if the, th this server gets hacked, then uh, t uh, somebody could be masquerading as that server and they're not actually that server, right? They could be anywhere because the, the private key for uh, uh, google.com has been stolen. Uh, the, uh, if your browser is, uh, is working for the enemy, then you might see the lock because it's just been told to put the lock up. Uh, there, there are really bad things. Like uh, uh, my dad actually fell for www.amazon.com, which which is a real thing, right? Dot uh, foobar dot evil dot com, uh, and 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 the trick is it was just like uh, uh, you know so some random hexadecimal stuff, and they had an HTTPS because it's okay. They got a they got a wildcard evil dot com HTTPS uh, certificate. It wasn't called evil dot com. Uh, some some random throwaway thing. Uh, so, so, so the problem is, like, you see that, you see the lock icon, you're like, oh, okay, that's good. But uh, it ha has to be, you, you got to get the bounds uh, uh, just right on, on the thing. Most people are really used to seeing long strings of gibberish in the URL. Yeah, just ignore those. Those are fine, unless they're trying to kill you. <laughs> uh, so HTTPS uses all of these things. So uh, uh, HTTPS begins, so if, if, and uh, I don't have time to really do this in detail. So I, I've got a packet capture from doing AES, at, or doing SSH. I, my, my Chrome uh, connects to some server and it says, I support a bunch of different encryption schemes, right? Like uh, uh, I, I can do ChaCha, I can do elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, we can do just normal RSA Diffie-Hellman, like you, you name it, I got, I got a bunch of stuff. Server sends back saying, let's do TLS, ECDA, RSA with AES 256, GCM, at SHA 384 and the browser's like, yes, got it, let's do that. So in, in that case, uh, TLS is the transport layer security. That's the sort of protocol that they're using to send encrypted stuff back and forth. Uh, ECDHE is the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, right? So that's, that's used to set up the shared key uh, between both sides. We do an RSA authentication step. So the HTTPS certificate is basically RSA authenticated. We're doing advanced encryption standard, the normal symmetric key crypto. Uh, and that, that's the 256-bit shared key that we established with ECDHE and then validated with RSA. Uh, Galois counter mode is used to uh, uh, basically uh, update the key as more and more blocks are sent across the network. And then SHA-384 is used to check some every block uh, so that somebody can't inject data uh, they don't know what it's going to decrypt to, but they know they're going to mess up your communication somehow. So may, sometimes that's enough. So, so you, 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 they, they actually uh, do hashes on the, uh, the packets, the, the messages that uh, they go across. So questions about that? So like, that's, that's self-explanatory, right? <laughs> a lot of moving parts. This is a huge reason to just use a web browser, because you say HTTPS, it does all of this automatically. 
and in a few milliseconds. And in a way that like A is implemented in a pretty good fashion and B, if it's broken, it's the browser's problem. They fix it and they will, they will get the thing updated. You just gotta make sure it's HBS and then you're, you, generally speaking, pretty, uh, pretty good. Questions? So if some service requires that you install additional certificate authority. Oh, that's a really bad idea. Yeah, like UAF. That is a, do we, no, uh, the, the UAF has a root CA that's used only for the Wi-Fi stuff. Okay. It doesn't go into, and, and this is the problem with having like the, uh, we'll have a program that just rifles around your machine and changes things that need to be changed. Uh, yeah, it, uh, th th there are, so, so uh, there was a big scandal where Asus or somebody had uh, shipped with a backdoor root CA so they could man in the middle your, so w which company was it? Lenovo. Lenovo, yeah. So, so the, the, the idea was, that, I mean, th th they're, they're actually, uh, uh, there's some companies where like every company laptop, everything in the company network has a root certificate from the company. So the companies like uh, uh, their firewall can man in the middle all of the all the traffic, even the HTTPS traffic. So bad idea to access your bank unless you really are trusting the company and all of the company's IT people with your bank account details. Uh, right. So we, we uh, so Friday we do uh, uh, we will do cryptocurrencies and it uses all of this. So uh, good good chance to review that stuff. Uh, projects due tonight.